Have you ever heard the phrase Megalodon Graveyard? If you haven't, just hold on to it for a second, because it's one of the eeriest, most useful ways the fossil record tells a story. Picture yourself on a coastal cliff more than three million years ago. The wind still tastes of salt. The waves still slap the rocks with that familiar, impatient rhythm. The sky looks almost modern, but under the surface is a shadow that makes the entire ocean seem to lower its voice, Megalodon. A predator around 15 to 20 meters long, up to roughly 60 feet, built like a muscular submarine. Broad, blunt head, a thick torpedo-shaped body made for steady cruising, and jaws that swing open like a set of gates lined with multiple rows of huge, triangular, serrated teeth. When those jaws close, the water itself seems to flinch. And then, one day, it's gone. Not rare, not maybe hiding deeper. Gone. There's no grand farewell scene. No heroic slow motion exit. In the modern oceans, Megalodon simply isn't there. Just silence stretched across the seas like cold fog. Here's where the story turns properly unsettling. Megalodon's end doesn't look like a gentle fade out. It looks more like the collapse of a dynasty. What if the mystery isn't solved by a single dramatic clue? What if the answer isn't hiding in a few scattered teeth, but in concentrated layers of sediment? True megalodon graveyards, places where geology patiently gathered the last traces of pad, a giant. Before we sprint straight into the graveyard, there's something important to understand. A megalodon graveyard rarely contains a megalodon body. Sharks are built mostly on cartilage, and cartilage is terrible at becoming fossil. What survives best are teeth, and megalodons shed teeth like a living trail of breadcrumbs. Sharks replace teeth throughout their lives. For a titan like this, every tooth that dropped to the seafloor was basically a fingerprint left behind for the future. So when paleontologists talk about a graveyard, they often don't mean a pile of skeletons. They mean a place where time stacked up enough evidence to reveal a pattern. It's not necessarily a scene of instant mass death. Most often, a graveyard is a hot spot, a patch of seafloor where currents and coastlines concentrate life and where hard parts accumulate year after year. Picture a busy junction, whales passing through predators circling and a giant shark cruising in the traffic. When conditions are right, those traces don't stay scattered. They get buried, sealed and preserved for ages under mud. Think of it like reading history in a layered cake. Each band of sediment is a page. Some pages are thin, some thick. Some are full of life. Others show gaps, disruption, and change. And once you start matching those pages across different coastlines, you're not just tracking one shark. You're tracking an ecosystem shifting under its fins. You're asking the bigger question, what happens to a super predator when the world it depends on quietly moves the goalposts? Our first stop is somewhere that feels surprisingly modern, the southeastern United States. In North Carolina, around Lee Creek and Aurora, ancient marine sediments rich in phosphate have produced an eye-watering number of shark teeth, megalodon included. Some of these teeth are so thick and sharp that just looking at them makes you instinctively curl your fingers in as if your brain is whispering gloves. Now. Phosphate-rich deposits often form where biological productivity was high, lots of life in the water, lots of remains sinking down, lots of material getting buried and concentrated. In places like this, the seafloor becomes a kind of natural filing cabinet, and teeth are the documents that survive best. Head north along the Chesapeake Bay, and you reach Calvert Cliffs in Maryland, an exposed wall of geology sculpted by waves as if the Earth is flipping through its own photo album. These Miocene to Pliocene layers are packed with stories, whales, seals, bony fish, and of course, enormous teeth. Fossil hunters like to joke, if Megalodon ever had a dentist, that dentist would have retired early. It's a cheeky line, but teeth really do talk. Places like Lee Creek and Calvert suggest Megalodon spent a lot of time in warm, shallow coastal waters, rich in prey biological highways, where everything is crowded, busy, and dangerous. 
Then the trail pulls us south and across the equator to Peru, where the irony is that to find an ancient sea you often walk into a desert. In the regions around Ica and Arequipa, the Pisco Formation is bone dry today. It's the kind of landscape where the wind feels like it's polishing the world. But millions of years ago, this was a nutrient-rich coastline powered by upwelling currents, cold, deep water rising to the surface, delivering food like an endless buffet. High productivity means lots of animals living, feeding, dying, and being buried. That's why Pisco can feel unreal. You can stand in sand and see whale skeletons exposed like props on an empty stage, as if the ocean stepped out for a moment and forgot to come back. Zoom out on the map, and the point becomes clear. Megalodon wasn't a local king. Traces appear in Japan in Neogene sediments on the Boso Peninsula. In Australia, sites like Bomaris Bay near Melbourne preserve late Miocene to early Pliocene layers with shark teeth and marine mammal bones. In Western Australia, around areas such as Cape Range and Exmouth, researchers have also reported megatooth teeth in rocks that were once seafloor. In other words, when the dynasty faltered, it didn't falter in one corner of the ocean. The pattern hints at something bigger, something global, pressing down on an animal that had ruled for millions of years. So, what turned those coastal paradises into a trap? The answer probably isn't another monster showing up to defeat Megalodon in some prehistoric blockbuster showdown. It's something slower, quieter, and far more ruthless climate, and the shape of the sea itself. By the late Pliocene, Earth cooled. Ice expanded at high latitudes. Ocean temperatures shifted. Sea levels rose and fell. Currents reorganized. And warm, shallow shelf seas, stable, food-rich environments along coasts began to shrink. For a giant predator, losing hunting grounds isn't just like changing restaurants. It's losing an entire support system where you hunt, where you cruise efficiently, and most importantly, where the next generation grows up. It sounds funny, if you put it in human terms. The biggest shark ever needed a nursery, but the evidence points that way. Research based on hundreds of teeth from the Gatun Formation in Panama suggests it may have been a nursery area with many teeth belonging to juveniles and subadults in a shallow, productive setting. Later work has suggested Megalodon may have used multiple nursery zones across different times and regions, much like modern sharks do today. And here's the strategic weakness. You can be the heavyweight offshore, the terror of the open ocean, and still lose your future if those warm, shallow nurseries get squeezed out by cooling seas and shifting coastlines. While the environment tightened its grip, Megalodon's menu also began to change. A shark that size needs a steady supply of large marine mammals, especially whales. But the Pliocene was a period of ocean reorganization. Whale groups shifted their ranges. Many lineages adapted to cooler waters and longer migrations. Prey didn't vanish overnight, but the right species, the right size, and the right place at the right time became harder to guarantee. And when food turns patchy, being enormous stops being a superpower. It becomes expensive. Every long cruise costs energy. Every missed opportunity matters more. Then there's competition. When the buffet shrinks, smaller, more flexible predators often do better, especially in cooler waters. The great white shark, far smaller than Megalodon, is a classic example of a hunter with broad tolerance and efficient design. It can exploit different prey, different temperatures, different habitats. And among toothed whales, you don't even need to pin it to a single modern name to see the trend. Warm-blooded, intelligent marine mammals with cooperation, endurance, and comfort in colder water become very effective competitors when they adding resources tighten. When ecosystems get squeezed, biggest isn't always best. Sometimes adaptable wins. So when did the final blow land? Stratigraphic records and careful checks on fossil reliability suggests the youngest trustworthy evidence for Otodus megalodon ends in the early Pliocene, around 3.6 million years ago. Some younger claims are often suspected to be reworked teeth, older fossils eroded out of ancient layers and redeposited into younger sediments, like a loose page from an earlier chapter slipping into the next. 
That's why scientists can be cautious. A tooth found in a younger layer isn't always proof the animal survived that late. It may be an older tooth that time relocated. And that brings us to the legacy of a lost, giant, frightening, yes, but also strangely useful. Megalodon is a reminder that even the top predator on Earth can be fragile when the foundation shifts. A few degrees of temperature change, a swing in sea level, a rerouting of currents, a nursery habitat disappearing, a key prey base becoming less reliable. An empire that lasted for millions of years can fall within a relatively short slice of geological time. The unsettling part is that the lesson isn't locked in the past. Modern oceans are being stretched by warming habitat loss, changing currents, and declining prey in many regions. The forces aren't identical and the details differ, but the theme is familiar ecosystems don't need to explode to be transformed. Sometimes they just drift quietly into a new shape, one that no longer fits the old rulers. So if one day you see a megalodon tooth behind museum glass in a field photograph or tucked into a handful of sand, treat it like a signal from an ancient sea. It isn't bragging I used to be a monster. It's whispering I beat every rival, but I couldn't beat change. And, um, that might be the most chilling part of all.